the next place is Virgil Weddle. And I gave him uh, rat poison in his uh, dessert. What kind of dessert? It was a green pistachio pudding. I was surprised that the rat poison had worked so fast. And that he turned blue within five ten minutes. To most people in the medical field, the feeling of helping those suffering is a reward in itself. But for Donald Harvey, it was the perfect opportunity to have ultimate control and power over a person's life. His story would ultimately unravel secrets that remained in the dark for almost two decades. Why would a nurse murder his helpless patients? Was he trying to put them out of their misery? Or was there something much more sinister afoot? Welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we tell mysterious tales of true crime cases from across the globe. And today, we're looking at the story of the angel of death, Donald Harvey. But before that, if you haven't subscribed to our channel already, please consider doing so. Hit the like button and click on the notification bell to get the latest content. Let's dive right into the story without any further ado. Born on April 15, 1952 in Hamilton, Ohio, Donald Harvey was the oldest of three children. The boy, with his big brown eyes and curly hair, was lovingly called Donnie by his parents, Ray and Goldie Harvey. Shortly after his birth, the family moved to Boonville, Kentucky, a small community nestled away on the eastern slopes of the Appalachian Mountains. There, Ray worked as a tobacco farmer while Goldie tended to the children and home. While the couple was struggling from extreme poverty, their marriage began to fall apart. Despite a rocky relationship, they were loving and nurturing to their three children. Although Donald was a quiet boy who mostly kept to himself, he apparently had shown no signs of any abnormality. Perhaps the seed of his sadistic and twisted mind was sowed long ago in his past. According to some reports, Donald was sexually abused and assaulted by at least three different men between the ages of four and twenty. One of them was his own uncle on his mother's side, who molested him during visits to his grandmother's home. Another one of those sexual predators was an older neighbor who offered Donald money for sexual favors. At the age of 18, Donald claimed that he was sexually assaulted by his then roommate, Randy White. Though a traumatic past is no excuse for heinous crimes, it might be a point of discussion for psychologists and criminal profilers. In school, Donald always seemed to be a loner and antisocial. He rarely participated in extracurricular activities, opting instead to read books. While this got him good grades, it also earned him a reputation for being the teacher's pet, which led to teasing. Following his graduation from Sturgeon Elementary School, Donald entered Boonville High School in 1968. Despite his good scores, he rapidly became bored with the daily routine, which prompted him to drop out. He later received a diploma from a correspondence school out of Chicago, and got his GED the following year at the age of 16. Having no future aspirations, Donald didn't know what he would do with his life at this point. He eventually relocated to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he managed to secure a job at a local factory. Donald was doing well in his job until the work dried up at the plant in 1970, and he was eventually laid off. A few days later, his mother called him and asked him to travel to Kentucky and visit his ailing grandfather who was recently placed in Marymount Hospital in London, Kentucky. He had no idea that agreeing to his mother's request would forever change the course of his life. While visiting his ill grandfather every day, Donald formed a trusting bond with the hospital workers. In fact, they liked him so much that he was offered a job at the hospital. It was here that a terrifying journey of madness and mayhem began, which would go on to last nearly 20 years. Donald's true motive for wanting to work as a nurse's aide might not even be known. However, some people believe that he was desperate to earn money after losing his previous job. He was not a trained nurse or doctor, but the hospital staff had full faith in him. Donald's duties required him to spend hours alone with patients, including changing bedpans, inserting catheters, and passing out medications. While looking after the patients was by no means an easy job, Donald's first few weeks at the hospital were uneventful. That is, 
until one incident with an elderly patient snapped something within him, a disturbing beginning to an unfathomable string of events. It was May 31, 1970, and Donald was taking care of an 88-year-old stroke victim, Logan Evans. During an evening shift, he walked into a private room to check on the elderly patient, and Mr. Evans rubbed feces in Donald's face. Although the patient was most likely not in his right mind following his stroke, the incident angered Donald so much that he lost all control. The next thing he knew, he was smothering the elderly man with a blue plastic bag and a pillow. Once Evans was motionless, Donald listened to his heart rate with a stethoscope to make sure that he was dead. He then disposed of the plastic bag and cleaned him up, dressing him in a clean hospital gown and showering before notifying the nurses. After this incident, no eyebrows were raised and no questions were asked. I went to pull back the sheet. He covered me in stool within his hand and I smothered him to death. How, how did you do that? With a pillow. As a predator who just got his first taste of blood, Donald's thirst for killing only grew. The very next day, he was looking after another elderly patient, 69-year-old James Tyree. Donald, it seems, used the wrong size catheter on him. Tyree initially let him proceed, but then yelled at him to take it out. Donald used the heel of his hand to control him until he vomited blood and died due to an air embolism. Again, no suspicions were raised. As no one detected foul play in his first two murders, Donald became more carefree. Just three weeks after committing his first murder, he cut off the oxygen tank of 42-year-old patient Elizabeth Wyatt. This was the beginning of his mercy kill, as he would call his killings later. He claimed he was aware that she was praying to die, and even told him she wished she could die. So he killed her to end her suffering. Four hours later, a nurse found her dead. Again, no one questioned Donald. Since no one at the hospital became suspicious, Donald saw this as an opportunity to unleash his inner monster. Over the next 10 months, 15 patients died under his care while working at the hospital. Be it pleasure or experimentation, the methods of each murder varied. Smothering, sabotaging oxygen tanks, injecting lethal drugs, overdosing people with medication, it seems he would use almost anything to kill. When angered, his methods became more brutal. On one occasion, after an argument with a patient, Donald snuck into the patient's room and inserted a coat hanger through his catheter, puncturing his bladder and bowel. As a result of the puncture, infection set in, and the man died a few days later. Despite this brutality, Donald always considered these killings to be merciful. The self-proclaimed angel of death wanted to play God with the lives of the vulnerable, cloaking his monstrosities in a warm blanket by giving them the title Mercy Killings. March 31, 1971, exactly one year after his first murder, was the last day Donald worked at Marymount Hospital. That evening, he was arrested for a burglary he committed while drunk. In his drunken stupor, Donald incoherently confessed about the murders to the cops, but no one took him seriously. Donald ultimately faced charges of petty theft. Instead of serving prison time, he paid a hefty fine. Although Donald managed to remain free, this incident changed the course of his life for a brief time. For the next few months, Donald tried to get his life back in order and eventually found work as a part-time nurse's aide at Cardinal Hill Hospital in Lexington. In June of 1973, he started a second nursing job at Lexington's Good Samaritan Hospital. He worked both jobs simultaneously until deciding to move on to other positions. Between August 1974 and September 1975, he worked first as a telephone operator in Lexington and then as a clerk at St. Luke's Hospital in Fort Thomas, Kentucky. For some reason, Donald was able to control his urge to kill during this time. It's possible that he simply did not have the same access to the patients as he did at his previous workplace, which could also explain why he shifted from job to job during this time. Despite his efforts to keep his killing urges in check, his inner demons slowly became increasingly more difficult to manage, finally driving him across the state line into Cincinnati, Ohio. In September 1975, Donald moved back to Cincinnati, and within weeks, he started working the night shift at the Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital. 
He worked there as a nursing assistant, housekeeping aide, cardiac catheterization technician, and autopsy assistant. As he became more comfortable in a hospital setting once again, he started right where he had left off. Since he worked at night, he had very little supervision and unlimited access to all the areas of the hospital. Over the course of the following 10 years, Donald would end up murdering at least 15 patients while working at the hospital. To relish all his crimes, he even kept a detailed diary of his murders and took notes on each victim. These grisly details included sprinkling rat poison in a patient's dessert, pressing a plastic bag and wet towel over the mouth and nose, injecting cyanide into an intravenous tube, adding arsenic and cyanide to orange juice, injecting cyanide into a patient's buttocks, and many more. The next patient is Virgil Weddle. And I gave him um, rat poison in his uh, dessert. What kind of dessert? It was a green pistachio pudding. I was surprised that the rat poison had worked so fast and that he turned blue within five to Yet the depravity of his crimes did not end there. Throughout his murder spree, Donald was experimenting with different methods based on medical journals he was studying for hints as to how to better conceal his crimes. Cyanide soon became his favorite tool for murder. He'd mix it into the victim's food or pour it directly into their gastric tube. Over the years, he amassed an astounding 30 pounds of cyanide, which he had slowly pilfered from the hospital. He would keep his deadly supply at home for safekeeping. I started using morphine because it wasn't controlled that much in Kentucky, especially in small hospitals in the 1970s. And um, I did unplug a couple of ventilators. I used cyanide, I used arsenic, I used adhesive cleaner, a plastic bag too. Despite all the deaths, Donald Harvey always managed to stay under anyone's radar. He had carefully set up all of his killing to look like accidents or natural causes. Donald even earned himself the nickname the Angel of Death and the Kiss of Death amongst his co-workers. They all thought it was a coincidence that he was always around when these deaths occurred. Little did they suspect that their charming co-worker was a silent predator. They didn't give me permission, no, but some of the patients didn't have no one to give permission for them. They didn't have a choice, and sometimes there was no family there to make that choice for them. And I made it for them. I was being the judge and the jury and executioner. Although years down the line, Donald insisted that his crimes were merely an act of mercy, motivated by compassion, there were other crimes that speak otherwise. The beginning of the 1980s brought out variations in both Donald's life and his crimes. Without a doubt, these crimes were purely driven by rage and revenge. In the early 1980s, Donald briefly began dating a man named Doug Hill. The relationship was challenging from the start, as they argued on a regular basis. After one of those heated fights, Donald retaliated by slipping arsenic into Doug's ice cream. Although he survived, the incident signified the first instance where Donald tried to harm someone outside of the hospital. This was a chilling sign that the monster had begun to stretch his boundaries. Following another fallout with Doug, Donald moved in with another lover, Carl Hoeller, within a short period of time. The relationship was going well in the beginning before Donald suspected Hoeller of cheating on him. Out of jealousy, he would add small doses of arsenic into Hoeller's food so that he would be too ill to leave their apartment. At this point, Donald's acts of revenge were no longer limited to his home or workplace. On one occasion, following an argument, he laced one of the beverages of his female neighbor with hepatitis serum, which nearly killed her before the infection was diagnosed and treated. While luck was on her side, it wouldn't be the same for another of Donald's neighbors, Helen Metzger. The arsenic he put in one of her pies caused her death at a local hospital a week later. Donald's confidence was soaring high after getting away with so many murders, he must have felt invincible. In April 1983, after a tiff with Hoeller's parents, Donald regularly began to poison their food with arsenic in small doses. On May 1, 1983, Hoeller's father, Henry, suffered a stroke and was admitted to Providence Hospital. To complete his unfinished business, Donald placed arsenic in his pudding before leaving during a hospital visit. Sadly, the elderly man died later that night. 
Donald continued to poison Carl's mother, Margaret, off and on for the next year, but was unsuccessful in his attempts to kill her. In January 1984, Howeller broke up with Donald and asked him to move out. Needless to say, Donald was not happy about it. Unable to accept the rejection, he spent the next two years trying to kill his former partner with his poisonous concoctions. As a means of revenge, Donald even went to great lengths in an unsuccessful murder attempt against one of Howeller's female friends. Though he managed to land Howeller in the hospital at one point, his attempts to eliminate him from the face of the earth had failed. The first cloud of suspicion that loomed over Donald's head was on July 18, 1985, when security guards noticed Donald acting suspiciously and decided to search his gym bag. Inside the haversack, the guards discovered a 38 caliber pistol, hypodermic needles, surgical scissors, gloves, a cocaine spoon, various medical texts, two occult books, and a biography of serial killer Charles Sobraj. Fined $50 for carrying a firearm on federal property, Donald was then given the option to quietly resign from his job rather than be fired. Call it a stroke of luck or pure negligence from law enforcement side, none of these ever appeared in his work record, and the hospital authorities did not open an investigation to determine if the man was responsible for any other crimes while working at the hospital. It took Donald seven months to secure another job at a local hospital. In February of 1986, he started working as a part-time nurse's aide at Drake Memorial Hospital in Cincinnati. Unaware of his past and impressed by his performance, his new employers soon offered him a full-time position at the hospital. Before long, Donald settled back into his old routine. Over the next 13 months, Harvey murdered another 26 patients and attempted to kill several more by disconnecting life support machines, injecting air into veins, causing suffocation, and injecting arsenic, cyanide, and petroleum-based cleaners. The two-decade-long murder spree came to an end with one last murder. On March 7, 1987, a 44-year-old patient, John Powell, mysteriously died. Powell was on life support from a bad motorcycle accident for several months before his demise, but had since started to recover. Due to Ohio's law of a mandatory autopsy for vehicular homicide, this death landed Donald in a situation that he had never faced before. During the autopsy, an assistant coroner noticed the faint scent of almonds, which is a telltale sign of cyanide. Authorities got involved in the death following this concerning discovery. Initially, suspicion fell upon the people closer to Powell, but investigators failed to come up with any evidence or motive pointing toward any of Powell's friends or family members. So, it did not take them long to focus on hospital employees who had access to Powell's room. Donald Harvey was one of those names on the shortlist. To rule out their names, hospital employees at this point were volunteering to take polygraph tests. Donald also volunteered to take a test and even bought a book on how to beat lie detector tests. But eventually, he did not go through with the test and called in sick on the day of his scheduled appointment. If this was not concerning enough, investigators learned about his questionable partner from the VA hospital, as well as his notorious hospital nickname, Angel of Death. Given the numerous unusual deaths that seemed to surround him, authorities began to focus their entire investigation on Donald. He was brought in for questioning. In the initial interrogation phase, Donald denied having anything to do with Powell's murder and portrayed himself as a victim of coincidence. It was only after hours of questioning and playing a bit of good cop, bad cop that he finally confessed to having put cyanide in John Powell's G-tube. He tried to explain that it was because he felt sorry for him and his family. He still denied responsibility for any of the other suspicious deaths. Donald was taken into custody while investigators began to look for other evidence. On August 11, 1987, Donald Harvey, 35 at the time, sat down with investigators and confessed to committing 33 murders over the previous 17 years. The number grew to 70 in total as the days passed. Investigators wanted Donald to be checked for his mental state before his claims were taken to be accurate, as they were doubtful of the numbers Donald provided them. Justice Center and sat down with Donald and I said, have you killed more than one person? And I asked him to tell me how many people was killed. And he said, you don't understand, I can only estimate. 
and I told him to, in his mind, pick a number that he knew it could not possibly go beyond. He said 70. Following several psychiatric tests by numerous experts, it was determined that Donald knew the difference between right and wrong and was able to conform to the conduct of the law. Hence, he was sane and competent. In November of 1987, Donald Harvey was sentenced to eight life terms plus 20 years for the murders in Mary's Mount Hospital. In February 1988, he entered guilty pleas on three additional Cincinnati homicides and three attempted murders, drawing three life sentences plus three terms of seven to 25 years. The investigation into the remaining deaths were closed after two years, as investigators determined that there was not enough evidence to implicate him in the murders. Whether people were stunned or disgusted by his actions, they definitely were intrigued to know what went on inside his sick mind. In a 1991 interview, a reporter from the Columbus Dispatch asked Donald Harvey about his motive behind the killings. Giving away a rare glimpse inside his mind, Donald said that the reign of terror began with a desire for control. In his eyes, people controlled him for 18 years, and then he controlled his own destiny. He loved the power, and to be able to control whether people lived or died. Even in the world of serial killers, Donald Harvey holds a special place, not only because of his overwhelming kill count, but also because of his choice to kill people he personally knew in addition to his patients. According to an article published on July 23, 2001 by the Associated Press listing the worst serial killers in the United States, Donald Harvey held the number one place, even surpassing the notorious John Wayne Gacy. While everyone expected Donald Harvey to spend his days behind bars, and unlike his unfortunate victims, die a natural death, destiny had something else in store for him. On March 28, 2017, 64-year-old Donald Harvey was found badly beaten inside his cell in protective custody at the Toledo Correctional Institution in Lucas County. He would die two days later at the age of 64 from blunt head trauma due to skull fracture and brain damage. Months after the death, an inmate named James D. Elliott, serving 37 years for numerous burglary offenses, would later write the Toledo Blade and confess to the murder. In those letters, Elliot confessed to punching and stomping on Donald in his cell. He said he grew up in Kentucky near some relatives of Donald's victims and claimed that he committed the crime to give them some closure and peace of mind. Hopefully, everyone from our area will take some solace in the fact that one of their own gave Harvey the punishment that he should have gotten from the courts, Elliot was quoted as writing. In September 2019, Elliot was sentenced to life in prison after pleading guilty to the murder of the infamous Angel of Death. To his last day, Donald Harvey insisted that the majority of his killings were out of mercy. But the truth is, in the process of becoming a murderer from a nurse, Donald appointed himself the judge, jury, and executioner over people's lives. Perhaps because he was not caught for decades, he assumed it was his right to control other people's lives. Do you think that Donald revealed the true count of his victims? Or do you think his words should not be trusted? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. If you like our content, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more gripping stories like this.